em inglês mesmo, mas, bom, queria agradecer vocês pela, pela presença aí, me apresentar, sou o Gustavo Brigato, uh, o fundador do, do, do startups.com.br e, e editor e, e CFO e eu, Chief Everything Officer, né? eu, vi, eu vi essa outro dia e gostei, sou o Chief Everything Officer aqui do, do Startups, é, queria agradecer a vocês pela, pela presença, pela uh, dar um tempinho aí para a gente conversar um pouco. A ideia com, com o Geoff aqui é falar um pouco sobre o programa da, da Y Combinator e também sobre uh, startups e, e como é que ele está enxergando o, 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 o mundo aí agora uh, durante e pós pandemia, né? Então, é, vou virar aqui para o inglês para a gente começar a nossa conversa só para não perder tempo. So, Geoff, not to, not to waste any time, thank you very much for, for making the time to, to, to talk to us. To, to us. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here. And, uh, I mean, YC, we don't have to, uh, to make any introductions about, about YC. Uh, I, what what uh, I think I, I would like I'd, li I'd like to, to start actually uh, uh, with the the, the, the uh, asking the que the question that it's the name the name of this live this webinar this live is how to get into YC. Well, Gustavo, first thanks for having me. I know it's um. It's very hot there <laughs> and getting a little later in the afternoon. So I appreciate everyone coming and spending the time with us to talk about, well, you know, my favorite topic in the world, which is startups and NYC and how, how we um, play a role in an ecosystem that is extraordinarily important for the creation of value and wealth and standards of living and improving the lives of everyone involved in every country in which it takes place. So um, as I was, I was saying to you, Gustavo, before we started, I, I've been to Brazil twice. I think it's super exciting, the startup ecosystem you have there. And so I'm happy to, to talk about startups anytime. And we've had a lot of great Brazilian companies at YC, as you know. Um, how to get into YC? <laughs> That's a, a, a question that is both super simple <laughs> and it could take a conversation in all of itself. But I will say there's, um, there's one kind of pat answer, which actually, if you think about it, ought to be the way you answer the question, how do you get investment from anybody? Mm -hmm. Which is what, you know, when you get into YC, we're funding you. We give you, we give you, you get to do YC, but we give you cash in exchange for, for equity, mm -hmm. uh, how do you get someone to invest in you? Well, the simplistic but true answer is, well, be good. Create a good company. Have a good idea. Have good co-founders. Have mm -hmm. people who can build things and can demonstrate they can build things. Build something. Get users. Mm -hmm. Show that they really love what you're building. Simple. So simple, right? That's all you need to do. Find product market fit. If you don't have product market fit, have a path to product market fit. Right. If you don't have customers now, have a path to getting customers. Just, you know, build a good company and you will find people who want to fund you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a good company and it's a struggle to get people to fund you, well, that's interesting, right? That's something mm -hmm. to think about. But what, what is a good company now? I mean, has it changed uh, with the pandemic? Uh, the, the, con the concept of a good company has changed with the pandemic or is, is still, you're still looking for the same criteria or, uh, I mean, or how do you see the, the current scenario? Yeah, I mean, in a sense, the pandemic has changed everything and yet nothing. Um, <laughs> we still want to fund companies that can have some possibility of becoming an epic company, of becoming the next Airbnb, Dropbox, Stripe, DoorDash, Instacart, etc. But as long as I mentioned DoorDash and Instacart, it is clear that this transition to the online world has been accelerated by the pandemic. Why Zoom went from kind of a cool little tool to a company with a market cap of over a hundred billion dollars, right? This change is real. It's secular, meaning it will last for the foreseeable future. 
And so as you're thinking about the companies you're building, taking advantage of this acceleration is a good thing to do. And it does tend to focus the mind of investors on, oh yeah, this does look like it's a trend that's real and that we should pay closer attention to. Uh, speaking of, of, uh, of that, I mean, how much of this, uh, this change, you know, the, the secular change you think is going to be secular? I mean, uh, uh, how much will be secular? <laughs> Everything is running on asteroids right now, right? I mean, productivity, we are more, much more productive than we were before because we, we work over hours. Uh, we use e-commerce e a lot more because uh, there's no other option. Uh, and g digital banks, but as soon as things go back to what we used to call normal or, or whatever, uh, these things are going to uh, go back to to where? Yeah. I, mean, so, I don't know that I have way better insight than anyone on this call about how much things shift back and forth, but I'll just say some things that we all know, which is that some of the changes that have happened will be permanent. We've learned, we, we've been forced to experiment in ways that have taught us things. Uh, let, me, let me use an example from YC. Um, we always had an online version of Demo Day. There was a website you could go to, but we also had, you know, Demo Day. Uh, I like to say Demo Day, both, both words of Demo Day are exactly wrong. It's not about demos anymore because it's more of a presentation that companies make to investors. And it's not one day, it's two days. So it's all wrong. But we've called it Demo Day forever, so we're still going to call it Demo Day. And we've always had an online component to Demo Day, always. But it wasn't very good. And we have been forced to go entirely virtual. Instead of having a thousand investors come in and create that excitement, we've had to do it all virtually. And look, we have an incredible software team at YC and they did an incredible job of syncing the site up with Zoom so that you could look at and learn about a company and, and watch the founder make their presentation. And we reduced the, the length of the presentation because we figured it was just too long with people sitting at home and it worked great and we're going to continue to improve on it. And even when we can bring everyone back together again, that mm. secular improvement in the Demo Day online site will continue and we'll continue to use that. So for sure, there's going to be some hybrid of mm. how we run demo day. Indeed, there's going to be some hybrid of how we run our batches because we had to go all virtual. Yeah. Now, human contact is super important. It would be better to be in a room together. I'm a way better speaker in person. <laughs> That's a low <laughs> yeah. bar, I know, but I'm way better in person than I am on Zoom. It's better. I'd much rather do that. But then again, um, if you guys are all, are you all in Sao Paulo? I don't know where everyone uh, is. All over. All over. Well, it's a, wherever you are in Brazil, it's a long way from California. And there's a lot of overhead for me to travel there to do that. And this is really easy. That's interesting, right? Even though it's way better for me to be there in person, it's also way more likely that we'll get this talk together and do it if I can reserve just an hour instead of like four days <laughs> or a week <laughs> and an hour. So that change is going to re be real too. The, the, the flattening of the globe that if you've ever read a, a book by a guy named, a New York Times author named Tom Friedman, the world is flat, it's flatter now and flatter than it's ever been. This will be forever. We've all learned something and we're not going to unlearn that stuff. Now, how much, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to vary by industry, by industry, by person, by person, by company, by company. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that YC will remain a remote company the way we are now. Mm -hmm. I think it's unlikely that we'll be completely remote. We'll still bring people together. Our batches will still bring people together, but, right. yeah. but not the same way. Yeah, and I, mean, I think most of us feel like we're going to be spending a lot more time at home than we used to. <laughs> Uh, let, let me just, uh, one thing I, I didn't tell the audience, uh, one second. Uh, pessoal, é... ah, sim, o Felipe já, to... Felipe já até deixou ali uma pergunta no chat, mas a ideia é essa, se, já quis... se vocês já quiserem deixar as perguntas no chat, ou depois a gente é, deixa um, um tempinho para responder, uh, dependendo como, como fluir aqui. Mas quem quiser já pode ir deixando as perguntas, a gente, eu vou colocando na, a, ao longo da conversa, uh, dependendo como for, se, se alongar demais aqui, aí eu vou, eu vou fazendo ao longo e a gente não faz aquele tempo no final, senão a gente faz uns 10, 15 minutinhos no final, beleza? 
Sorry, Geoff. It's just uh, uh, you're telling so, them about the chat. And yeah, 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 yeah. So, oh, like, you, so you, you do understand. <laughs> Uh, well, you, you mentioned one thing about about the batch. Uh, I mean, you you'll be running your second batch, uh, virtual batch in, in ne next year, right? And what what I hear from from uh, Brazilians that that have participated in participated in your program program is that the best thing about participating at YC, I mean, apart from meeting you, of course, <laughs> uh, is the the contact right, is hanging out with other founders, uh, going to, to the bar and, you know, discussing stuff and you know, talking to people, uh, the, 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 pr the, uh, the presence, you know, being in the valley, living in the valley. Uh, how, how, are you doing, how, how are you doing that? Or how are you trying to, uh, are you trying to emulate this experience in, in the virtual batch in some, some way? Or, uh, I mean, how, how much your program is losing from, uh, for, for, for being entirely virtual? So um, I, I do think that that's very frankly a loss. As I was saying, human to human in-person contact matters to people. Now, I think the way you put it is they told you that the best thing about YC was that. That's not true. It's actually not true at all. The best thing about YC is that we make it, we make it way more likely that your startup is successful. And it is true that it helps. We're going to do everything we can virtually and in the future when we can get together to get people together. We're going to do things during the batch and after the batch to get founders together so they can get to know each other and, and, and create those bonds that really do matter, that make it a more enjoyable experience. It's always more enjoyable. This, again, I tell you, this would be way more enjoyable for everyone. You have to believe me if I was there in person, but that doesn't mean that you won't get some value out of this, I hope. And more importantly, and this is true, the startups in the last batch got an extraordinary amount of value from IC. And in some ways, Gustavo, this is true as well, they got more value than in previous batches because we wrote software for them that made it better. We had tighter contact between partners who were doing the advising and the batch members. And in the end, the demo day was so good, the fundraising environment was so good, is that the fundraising results are extraordinarily good. So I will still argue that we made it way more likely that the startups who, who went through YC have a, are on a successful trajectory. Mm -hmm. It is true. There's a loss there. I won't deny it that it's better to to shake people's hands and, and give people hugs and, and sit, there, sit down next to each other and complain and talk and commiserate and strategize and get advice, all that's better. Some of that you can do online, but it's not as good. But what our plan is, is in the future to bring people back together again. Once you're a YC founder, you're always a YC oh, founder. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I still do office hours with people from batches from 10 years ago. <laughs> I still really? do. And we'll continue to do that. And we all do. So I, I do think it's, you know, it's the facts of life in a pandemic and you make the best of them. But let's recall what the goal is here. The goal here is to create a company that creates value, that makes something that people want mm -hmm. and actually become successful. Mm -hmm. And I think from almost every perspective that I look at that, it's still as good as ever. Mm -hmm. Uh, Philippe was asking uh, if uh, the number of uh, applications increased uh, uh, now that you are virtual. Uh, I mean, new companies or companies that wouldn't apply are applying. Have you seen that happening? Yeah, there are uh, It's hard to say that the number of applications increased. The number of applications always increase. So <laughs> it's hard to say whether how many, they're increasing. How many do in particular because of COVID, this, this batch will, will get over 16,000 applications wow. for winter 21. And um, it'll probably be the most applications we've ever gotten. Um, but there are some applications for sure that we can identify where people say, oh wow, it's so much better for me because I'm in India now or I'm in Sao Paulo or Rio, or wherever you are in, in Brazil. And it's so much easier that I don't have to think about picking up my life and moving to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Not that by the way, it's not a good thing to move to Silicon Valley, but you know, for some companies, it's really difficult, especially if all your customers are there and it's a very sensitive time for your company. You really want to be close to your customers. And, you know, when Airbnb did YC, they spent all week in New York, which is where most of their customers were, and they'd come back for the key 
um, events at YC, mm -hmm. which was hard enough. But you know, that's a five or six hour six flight. Six hour flight, yeah. Yeah, to Brazil, it's 12, it's, or, you know, it's, yeah. it's crazy. Depending it's on the connection. Like, yeah. you, couldn't, you can't really do that. India is even farther. So for certain far flung places, it's been terrific to be able to have a just virtual batch. We'll have some hybrid in the future. No doubt we'll try to keep the best, the best parts of that. But uh, I think, you know, overall our applications are very healthy. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. <laughs> yeah, when, when we met, uh, I went to, to YC, I think it was sort of 2017 or 2018, uh, and you were relaunching uh, uh, Startup School. And you, you, you said something uh, uh, similar to this. Uh, you said that the, the, the idea is to, now you're going to have more, uh, options, right? You, people that wouldn't apply for the, the main program will apply to YC and we will have more, uh, uh, more material to look at. Uh, so in, in a way, this, this is happening now with the main program now. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a bit, a bit of a convergence between how Startup School has always run all virtually. Yep. Well, Startup School, we had in-person classes, but the vast majority of companies never came into Mountain View. We sort of just had the in-person because, again, it's easier to give a talk <laughs> with a bunch of people there. And it was a, you know, a great benefit for the people who could come in because, you know, it just feels more real. But, of course, everything's all virtual now. So there has been sort of a, a convergence in thinking about how we do run things virtually. And, by the way, both have played into whether our school now is getting better because of what, we've learning, what we're learning from from our batch program and vice versa start and the batch program is getting better because of what we learned from startup school so the mm -hmm. two programs really do work together hand in hand mm -hmm. and, and you you think that they're going to uh, be separate programs i mean uh, or maybe the main pro uh, uh, startup school will will become the 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 the, the main program or how do, how do you see the future for no they'll remain separate they're very different you know, startup school, we don't ask for any equity. It's free and open to anyone. Um, you can consider it to be a couple of things. The, the first and most important thing, I think, is it's, it's, it's a service that we provide for anyone who thinks entrepreneurship might matter to them. Even if you're not really a startup company, if you're starting a company of any kind, and a startup company, as Paul Graham defined it, is a high growth company that's sort of venture backable. Even if you're not starting one of those, there's lots of lessons overall that you can gather from, that you can, that you can um, take in from startup school. Um, but it's also a way for us to identify very promising companies and bring them into our core program, which is what our business is, right? Our business is to give funding and then take equity in return that will hopefully return well more than the funding that we put into the company. Mm -hmm. Speaking of funding, how, how do you think this, this is going to be uh, after the, the pan pandemic? Uh, I mean, before the pandemic, we had the, 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 there was already a discussion about unicorns, uh, you know, uh, uh, spending cash, you know, spending a lot of money without metrics and, you know, without, without caring about uh, uh, making money or making profit. Uh, and now uh, some, s some people are, are, are talking uh, not about unicorns, but camels, you know, all different animals that are coming, coming along. Uh, what kind of animal should a founder be, uh, aim to be in 2021 and ahead? And how, how are you going to be, uh, how do you see funding uh, going ahead? Ahead. I mean, I'm gonna, I still gonna see like uh, mega rounds and uh, companies not caring about making a profit, or that there will be also a fundamental change in the way these things go on. Well, um, first of all, I don't think it's correct to just say that companies didn't care about making a profit. <laughs> I think and it's only in the short term. Yes, uh, that's exactly right. I think it's more correct to say they chose to focus on investing and growth for a longer period of time mm -hmm. when it looked like capital would be freely available for a long time. Now, that's always a, a risky path to be on. And uh, we like to always say that you should have profitability within reach, even if you choose not to be profitable as a startup company, because that way you're... Um, you're insured of survival. And, uh, you know, look, 
uh, again, crystal balls are very difficult to find, especially accurate ones. <laughs> and all of your questions will depend on what 2021 looks like mm -hmm. and how long the pandemic lasts and what the impact on the economy is. If, if the economy recovers re relatively quickly, just all sorts of <laughs> dependencies on that, um, then I think that the availability of venture capital will, will remain great. Right now, it's great. Right it now, is. I mean, it's very uh, I, I, I was, it, I, uh, when, when uh, the pandemic hit, I thought, this is go all going to be, be over. I mean, like, like in Brazil, we, we, uh, I don't know if you have this expression in, in, in the US, but uh, in English, but it, we, we call it chicken flights. We are used to chicken flights, right? It takes off and then lands, takes off and then takes off and then the lands. It goes too lands. high and then it just splats. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, we are used to this kind of things. And when the pandemic hit, I said, oh, it's gonna be that. Venture capital, corporate venture capital, done. Nobody's gonna put any money on, on that. And, and it didn't, it, it, it's thriving. I, I still don't understand um, why. <laughs> my, um, a, a, an old um, boss of mine years ago used to talk about how when the economy got really difficult, venture capitalists get T-Rex arms. You know, they had these little tiny Oh, yeah, arms. yeah, yeah, okay. So they can't reach into their wallet because they're too small. <laughs> so, so um, and... And right as the pandemic hit, and there was so much uncertainty in the beginning months, everyone focused on their portfolio. They weren't making as many new investments. They, they were really careful. But as, as time went on and people sort of found a new normal and it looked like we were going to come through economically okay and that there was a lot of great startups and great opportunities, that sort of stopped. And the flow of capital, I think, has been tremendous. That doesn't mean it'll continue in 2021, I think it depends on the economic, on, on whether there's a very bad economic shock or not. And I don't think we've actually, we have an expression here that the other shoe hasn't dropped. And I, I don't think it has yet on this. So it depends. It could well be that venture capital dries up for a while. And if that happens, well, you should be thinking about that as a company. If you manage to raise a seed round, um, you better plan on that lasting perhaps longer than you thought otherwise. Mm -hmm. Staying, um, maybe not profitable, but staying lean. Staying lean is always a good idea. And um, it's a, everything in startups is a trade-off. There's a trade-off between trying to grow fast, which is what you really need to do to raise your next round and to dominate the competition versus mm -hmm. staying too lean and not growing because you're afraid to spend money. There's, there's a trade-off, but leaning into being lean, if I can <laughs> use those too many ways, is, is probably a smart thing now. And I, I, I would tend to recommend to companies that, that you approach the, the future with great care um, and, be, and be super aware that not only is this, this pandemic and this worldwide situation creating enormous risk, it's also creating enormous opportunity. And the key thing for startups is to put yourself in a position to take advantage of that, the first thing you do to be in position to take advantage of opportunity is to, is to survive, to have enough money to continue operations. So pay close attention to that more than ever before. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, maybe I'm not the, the, the right person to ask you that as I, I, I quit my job to launch a new company, but is it a good time to launch a new business to, to, to oh, start? Oh, it's a great new time to launch a new business. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. The opportunities are gonna be incredible. The world is changing more rapidly and so and, and opportunities are opening up in ways that we hadn't thought of before. So there's all sorts of new things to do and and, and old line businesses are realizing they have to be moved online. And so there's there, uh, there's opportunities galore. This is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we're uh, seeing that. We're seeing applications flow in from people all around the world thinking, wow, this is this is my time. Oh really? You hear that? Definitely. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great time. Again, I think, I think if you look at the wealth of the planet over the next decade or two, most of it's going to be driven by new businesses, you know, what we'll consider startups today. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in scenarios, or, 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 you know, like crisis or, or scenarios like that, the, the big uh, tends to, to become bigger, right? Uh, uh, more, uh, uh, more powerful. 
uh, how, how, how do you, uh, uh, I mean, so the, the idea is to go to the niche and then uh, you, you get away from competition? Um, I don't look at the world that way. Mm. I think that there are, you know, again, you could start, you can start with a niche if you want and find your way to a bigger opportunity. But the big guys tend to be slow moving and ponderous and there's way more opportunity in businesses that are maybe not even related at all to those businesses. Way more opportunity. I was just watching today, you know, we talk about the fangs. Well, mm -hmm. none yeah. of the fangs are, yeah. for example, I mean, building a supersonic jet. However, boom, a YC company. A, but but oh, it, it, it never told me to change, told, told them to change this name, boom, for a, for a plane? It's not really. <laughs> Well, you know, I guess the idea is a sonic boom, but yeah. Maybe yeah, yeah, I, know, I, know, I understand that, but, I mean. <laughs> but But they just released their XB1, their first plane today. Way different space, you know? And that's just an example, but of course, there's way different software spaces. There's, there, I think you should open your mind to the possibilities that a connected world represents. And the, the, the big guys, you know, Google still mostly does search. <laughs> Now they do a lot of other things too, but they're not going to come and take your space away from you. Go find your space, find a place where you can make a difference. And uh, I wouldn't worry about the big guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Camila is asking uh, the, uh, about unicorns and unprofitability. Uh, do you think that like Uber doesn't make any money and it, it, it made an IPO saying that probably will never make money? Uh, and you have a lot of other uh, examples. I, I think they said the possibilities they'd never make money. I don't think they said probably, but um, I, I, I will say, I will say, uh, this is sort of the same question you were asking, yeah. which is, look, if an investors create belief systems about the future, right? They all have to have a crystal ball like you were asking before. And um, investors will will um, support unprofitability as long as there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Look at Amazon. For the longest time, Amazon wasn't profitable. Turned out it worked out okay for those investors, right? It worked out okay. But one in now, a million, right? Same thing for Facebook. Facebook, okay. Facebook had no monetization plan for the longest time. Turned out okay, right? Turned out okay. Um, the, the reason is if the startup is truly grabbing market share in a market where the, um, where the sums add up. What I mean by that is where you can do math, which makes it really, makes it pretty obvious you're gonna be able to develop a profitable business. If I can look at what it really costs to serve per person okay. and the structure of my business, and I, I'm unprofitable because I'm spending on marketing and R&D, et cetera. But as soon as I lower those to a reasonable amount, or as soon as I grow to a reasonable mm -hmm. amount, my profit margins will allow me to be um, in the black. Then mm -hmm. investors will fund that for a long time. Now, so that being said... Positive unit economics, but, uh, you know, yeah, but I can uh, manage that. Uh, or you can spending. believe that your unit economics will, will, will get... To, like, you, can, you can make a case. You can say to me, Gustavo, look, Jeff, I, I know my margins are... Um, 35% right now, but here's why they're going to 70. And when I get to 70, my unit economics are gonna be beautiful. Also, CAC is going way down. You, you can make that sort of argument based on scale and you know, whatever argument you're making and say, but you know, once I get someone on, onto my platform, the lifetime value is, is this high. And so even though I'm unprofitable now, over time, I'm going to get vastly profitable. And mm -hmm. you can make that kind of argument. And if you can't, well then, Camilla, no, they'll stop funding you and you'll if you get to a point where you can't make that case anymore then you can be in a lot of trouble no matter mm -hmm. how big the company is and how successful it appears to be mm -hmm. uh, in this in you, you mentioned cost of acquisition uh, and I heard a lot of companies uh, a lot of startups saying that their cost of acquisition has uh, uh, decreased with the pandemic as they, they you know they, they are saving money uh, do you think that this, this is a temporary scenario maybe or maybe cost of acquisition will, will uh, uh, be lower uh, in the in the long term can be lower Um, I 
don't understand why the pandemic is making CAC um, in a secular way lower. Okay. Um, I, I don't see that. Uh, I think that, I think that it's, it's kind of, it's actually kind of a silly conversation because CAC is so dependent on each particular business and each particular industry and how it's affected by macro events is dependent on each industry. I don't know that, you know, you can imagine people staying home, Lord CAC for some businesses and, and raised CAC for others. <laughs> but I don't know that, I don't know that, uh, I don't know that I can come up with a formula that says, oh, this has changed things fundamentally um, for CAC. I, I don't, I don't think that's true. I, I think, you know, some of the things that had a big impact on, on CAC were platforms. Like platforms like, like Google and Facebook and the iPhone, mobile, had, it, had, had a very important impact on how companies were able to reach out to customers. And I don't know that those change radically <laughs> based on the pandemic. So I guess mm -hmm. I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. So you, you mentioned the, the macroeconomic scenario and you always uh, also said before about uh, the whole world being flat, uh, flattened, right? But uh, we have like here in Brazil and you have Trump in the US and you have all this anti-globalization trends in politics and you know, uh, company, uh, countries closing their borders. In fact, uh, yesterday Trump just uh, announced changes to the H H1B visa. Uh, and, I mean, how, how do you think that this, this particular, ch particular change, the, the changing H1B visas will uh, affect startups in, in, in the US and how you see the, the macroeconomic scenario, you know, all this, you know, protectionism and uh, 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 startups go, uh, uh, have, have more trouble being global or uh, that won't, af won't affect anything at all. Don't you find this to be just positively the most ironic thing of today's world <laughs> where we're just approaching a world where, you know, we can have this incredible relationship with people around the world where I can give a talk to, to, you know, a few dozen Brazilians right, around the world. <laughs> right. And, and we're, we're, we're able to connect like this at the same time as there's really a backlash against this very thing that we're doing, this global thing that we're doing. Um, I don't know how this plays out. It's worrying. It's super worrying. It's not just a backlash against globalism. It's a backlash against technology and the wealth technology creates. Um, it's a backlash because of some of the wealth inequality that exists in the world and that at least technology is perceived as playing a role in, um, which is very scary because technology and tech startups and the startups that we fund have the ability to make lives way better, mm -hmm. way better, but there it's causing a lot of angst. And I think that, that those of us in the industry have a responsibility to try to counter some of that angst without ignoring the real problems that exist. The problems that, for example, are built into the way Facebook runs their platform, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They're built into that. So you create this wonderful startup that seems like it's going to just connect people and all of a sudden you find you're helping people promote genocide or, or interfere in political interfere process, in processes, right? This is, so they're, they're, you know, all technology is, it has dual use and you have to be super cognizant of that. And mm -hmm. I think we have to do much better. I, I, I tend to think that the, the, um, the anti-globalists are just gonna lose because it's too easy now. It's just <laughs> technology has made it too easy. So I don't think they're gonna be very successful, but I think we should all be concerned with that backlash. I won't make any prediction on what and anything Trump does now, because I don't know how long it's gonna last. You might have heard, <laughs> we're about to have an election. Yeah, I, I was going to ask you that. Who should so, we root for, Biden or, or Trump? <laughs> Who, 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 who am I going to root for? Yeah. Or, or, or who should we root for as well? Well, I think Trump's been very damaging to the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think, I think, I think he's, he's partially a symptom of real problems and real angst. 
the tech that we've all created has, has made people anxious about their future. And some of that is, is just the progress around the globe. People are wondering what their role is going to be and they, they wanted change and he was a symptom of that. But he's, he's been, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate when a political leader makes um, untruths and spin and propaganda central to what they do. Whenever that happens, and you know this well in Brazil, yeah, you have a, a terribly, it's terrible for the individual and terrible for society. And so I think, I think he's been extraordinarily damaging and I hope he doesn't get another four years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're, you're not going to be rooting for him, that's for no. sure. <laughs> no, and, and you know, um, most people in the United States aren't going to be rooting for him. That doesn't mean that he, like, that happened last time too and he still won. So. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah that, that, that's a point. Every, every time I talk to someone, they say, oh, Biden's leading. Uh, I say, we've seen this movie before. He won. Right. Uh, and it's Trump different, won. though. It, but, it's yeah. different this time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have um, some confidence that if, if the election is fair, that he, <laughs> look, he, his path to victory is real but very narrow. Yeah, I mean, he, he likes to say to say stuff, right? And he's saying that if he loses, uh, it's, it's, it's not gonna be it's not gonna be a fair election. So it's yeah, this dangerous is, when that happens. This is a dangerous, horrible thing to be saying. That's most civil strife in the United States in a very dangerous way, and I think it's inexcusable, frankly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about uh, you mentioned uh, Brazil and uh, uh, Brazilian uh, founders, uh, and you you already uh, had sixteen Bra Brazilian companies in, in the program, and not to mention Henrique uh, and, and Brax, which is a huge success in the U.S. Uh, how, how do how how do you see Brazilian entrepreneurs and Brazil Brazilian the Brazilian ecosystem uh, growing? Uh, or, or changing in the, in the throughout the, these years. Uh, or, I mean, we are here. We are, we are, the, we are the frogs on, 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 uh, inside the, 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 the pan, right? Cooking, and we think everything is, is going fine. But looking from from abroad, uh, how, how do you see us? <laughs> well, I mean, Bolsonaro is a worrying guy, and. I don't know how that's going to affect the business environment in Brazil, but look, Brazil is a greater than $2 trillion economy, the largest economy in South America. And the Brazilian people, as far as I can tell, seem to be incredibly resilient and entrepreneurial. And uh, I suspect that we're going to see a lot more unicorns that come, whether, whether it's like, the the you know the um the, the kids from brex who came over and built a, an american company it will be an international company or um or or founders like you know others like the guys at carol or whatever who built companies mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. brazil um working within the largest economy in south america and maybe expanding to, to the other large economies in latin america i think we're going to see a lot more of that happen i think that that you know the, the venture ecosystem is growing and building in Brazil. There's increasingly a recognition that the opportunities in Brazil are enormous. And so I'm, a, I'm an optimist on, uh, on Latin America in general and Brazil in, in particular. I think that the, um, the, all other things being equal, if, if the government doesn't get too stupid and do too many things that hold you all back, hold entrepreneurs back, then you're going to see more, you know, Mercado Libre-like companies right. in Brazil, in Latin America, you know, not just in Brazil, but, you know, Argentina and, and, and Mexico and, and the other large economies in, in Latin America flourish. I, mm -hmm. I'm really very optimistic. And by the way, once you start building that ecosystem, then you get people from those companies start to branch out and create new wow. Yeah, fantastic new. companies. Yeah. So I think Nin that, 99 I think is a is great beginning. example, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, so I think this is going to become the beginning of uh, of really a flourishing of mm -hmm. Latin American um, entrepreneurship and founders.
Do you think that, uh, I mean, having a, a Brazilian uh, approach uh, is, is enough? Uh, looking at only at Brazil is enough? Or, or every company has to look at Latin America and think of a, of a broader, uh, on a broader perspective? Um, I think you can create a billion dollar company in Brazil alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you guys, you guys had to choose a different language than the rest of Latin America. I don't know why. <laughs> we had to be the different ones. <laughs> so that makes it a little more complicated. But the fact that, I mean, Portuguese and, and Spanish are close. And the fact that you have sort of a, a pretty tight knit group of, of countries is an opportunity. I don't think you have to do anything. Certainly in Brazil, you have a large enough economy that you can create billion dollar yeah. companies. It's a little harder in the smaller countries if, if you're in Venezuela, it's going to be hard just to be in Venezuela, right? <laughs> but but I'm, I'm asking that, I mean, because Brazil, of course, is a big market, but it's also, it's also, it's also a trap, right? Because, oh, Brazil is good enough. I, 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 I'll be doing everything here. I, I won't look at all the opportunities. At the same time, you have all the, the barriers, especially beginning with the language to, to grow in, in, in the region. Yeah, um, but it's a, it's a, trap but it's like it's it's a trap like the united states is a trap i mean it's one tenth the size of the united states but you know when you have one tenth the unicorns in brazil that we have in the united states then come talk to me <laughs> there's plenty of room to grow in brazil but i, I do think that you will find that you, you have actually an advantage in north america you pretty much after canada and mexico but you're going to go after you're going to go after Europe first and then Asia. Mm -hmm. America and Brazil, you have these big countries right next to you that are pretty convenient as, as a next step. So I think it's, it's fairly um, likely that large companies in any one of the markets will go to other markets. And look, you know, look, look at Rappi, right? Mm -hmm. They're you go from Colombia to Brazil to Argentina. They're, they're, they're expanding um, in all of the Latin American countries. Mm -hmm. so I think that's just more likely based on geography and and language and um, and culture. If you were to if you you were to start a business today or maybe next year, where 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 would you put your money or your efforts? Well, you know, um, first of all, I'm not I'm okay where I am, so I'm not about <laughs> to start another company. But the uh, I still think the United States is both ha has this convergence of the largest economy in the world for a while with yeah. the most for, what, entrepreneur for, uh, 10 friendly. Years, maybe? <laughs> What's that? For, yeah, for maybe. 10 years, maybe? Maybe. Uh, but, uh, but entrepreneur friendly, um, the, you know, with, uh, you know, a legal regime, which today is, 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 is friendly to, entrepreneurship to venture capital, the largest amount of venture capital available in the world. So still the United States is the best place to start a company. Um, mm -hmm. If you're going after the US market, if you're going after a particular market in Brazil, well, then you should go after Brazil. But, you know, clearly the, the vast majority of, of startup companies are gonna probably be in two countries over the next decade, United States and in China. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sp sp speaking of China, uh, how do you see uh, uh, how do you see ch Chinese companies and uh, Chinese tech uh, growing? Uh, ha have you hosted Chinese companies in the past, or you you are yeah. open for, we'll for, for Chinese the companies? It's, it's harder. You know, we, when I um, took over the job in May of 2019, we were just in the process of creating for the first time a YC version in China. And I decided it wasn't the right time to mm. do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which I think was fortuitous because it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, how, you know, China is on, a, um, <clears throat> is on a collision path with a lot of the rest of the world right now. And it's seen unfavorably in a lot of the rest of the world. And it's hard to say how that is going to play out, but in some sense it doesn't matter because the Chinese market itself is large mm. enough to create many, many, epic companies there. Now, you know, there are, there are real barriers in China too. You know, the, there's, there's way more corruption and the rule of law is not 
as, as, um, as clear as it needs to be to make businesses successful. And so you have a lot of, of, of cheating, right? Mm. And that makes it harder to want to be an entrepreneur there. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be a lot of great companies, but this is a fundamental disadvantage China has vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So we'll see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot to ask you when you mentioned things, are you uh, in favor of regulation, breaking up companies? Uh, or how, how do you see, uh, 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 what's your opinion on, on all that? Um, I think something has to be done. Mm -hmm. I think breaking up a company like Facebook is almost impossible. I don't know how you do that. Um, so uh, that seems unlikely, but I do think that since those platforms have become so influential, that if we want to have some voice, some representation in how we are governed, mm -hmm. and we don't want Mark Zuckerberg to be able to <laughs> choose to do that all on his own or choose too much of how our lives are run all on his own, then some regulation will be necessary, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Lorena has a, a, a question here. Uh, it may be you now that we are... For me because it's in Portuguese. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Lorena, do you want to ask it in, in English or do you want me to... I'll, I'll open up Lorena. Take a photo. I don't say fala inglês. Ah, tá bom, beleza. So uh, uh, I'll, ask, I'll ask it for her. Uh, if, if, se, se alguém mais tiver alguma pergunta, se alguém quiser levantar a mão aí, pode. Uh, como a gente está indo para os 10 minutos finais. So, Lorena, uh, I know her, her and she's building, uh, uh, she has a project called TPM, TPM Bank. It's a, a bank or a marketplace uh, targeted at women. Uh, I, I actually, uh, Lorena, I, uh, I heard uh, another project just like yours today. It's called Hefa. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that later. Uh, so what, what, she, what she's at, uh, saying is that in, in Brazil, uh, mo most of our population is, is women uh, and uh, unbanked, unserved uh, by banks and uh, CDE classes. And there's a gap uh, he, 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 and a gap in, in serving these, these people, this, this, uh, this, this segment of the population. And she thinks, and she thinks there's an uh, opportunity to build a super app with uh, financial, uh, including financial services and a marketplace. Super app, which is ch a Chinese idea. And uh, I mean, if you think that can happen, in, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if super apps can happen anywhere uh, but in, in China. Uh, so her, she's saying that her objective is to get, uh, is to show that to, to funds and venture, venture capital funds and venture capitalists uh, and, and show that women can surprise the economy uh, and uh, as, as their money is uh, almost invisible now. Do you think that this is this is an opportunity? I mean, uh, targeting uh, targeting only women, financial services for women. I mean, as we as we said, we, we spoke about niche niche uh, at the beginning. This is super niche, right? W what do you say? Do, do, have you seen anything like that you know, in the U.S.? I, I don't know. I don't know how to quite respond to call women a super niche. I mean, I think it's sort of half the population. So that's yeah. a pretty mm -hmm. big niche. Yeah, but I mean, um, as a marketplace targeted at, at them and... Um, you know, uh, I, I also see plenty of, um, of projects oriented around targeting, you know, a, a gender demographic, whether it's men or women. Um, and I don't know that, so I guess my fundamental feeling, Lorena, is that forever people have created products directly targeting just men. We know that, right? Like forever. And, and that wasn't, it wasn't um, necessarily thought out. It was just because that's the way people in their chauvinistic way thought of the world. And this was true even in 
in situations, I don't know, in, in, in the United States, more of the actual purchasing power in the United States is in women's hands than in men's hands. It doesn't matter. People still target the men, like, like advertising, et cetera, targeting, like, what are you thinking? Well, not, they weren't thinking. I don't know what that situation is in Brazil, but I suspect it's not no. that different. So uh -huh. from that perspective, it makes a ton of sense to target women with your products. Now, now does it make sense targeting women with financial products? My guess is yes. My guess is that all the advertising, all the messaging, the particular products that you build will be somewhat different for women than they would be for men. And that if you can get that right, then you have a possibility of taking share of, of that particular demographic because no one else is thinking that way or they'll think that way too slowly. So my guess is if it's done well, that yeah, that there is a way to target specifically women and to do quite well, especially again, not only, even if it was only half, it would be great, but I suspect that they actually have more than half of the purchasing power. Uh, again, I don't know what the situation in Brazil is, but I suspect that's true, in which case you have, um, you know, the potential to build a truly big business. Good. Does it, uh, cobriu, Lorena? Era isso que, legal, I can. Uh, so, Jeff, uh, as, Jeff, as we head into towards the end, I mean, uh, uh, I'd just like to, to wrap up with you and uh, sure. uh, ask you, uh, what are your, your hints or your uh, ideas uh, for, for founders and, and, and companies at this moment, uh, uh, you know, as we are in the middle of the pandemic, but they make hoping that we go get out of it, but no signs of getting out of it. Uh, uh, what, what, what do you see in where, where things are going? Well, um, so my hints are, and by the way, the interesting thing about these hints is they're not that different than the hints I always give, but, but more so. I mentioned being lean and careful and thinking backwards and perhaps thinking that you might not raise more money if you do raise some. I think that's very smart in today's world. Paying attention to where things are changing because of how the pandemic has forced us to change and thinking about which of those things will stick around. This acceleration to online, acceleration to remote, it's very interesting and different and will create lots of opportunities. A lot of businesses will, will experience enormous stress. That creates opportunities. Maybe you can take advantage of those by servicing them and helping them make it through to, um, so that they can survive the, you know, the, the, the difficulties that, that the pandemic is bringing upon them. Um, think hard about, about the, the, how plentiful venture capital may be now, but might not be in the future. And, um, think hard about how you're hiring and spending based on that. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the, the, the trick about surviving a pandemic is highly dependent on your particular business and what you're doing, but even more than you usually have to pay attention to it in a startup, think about survival, thinking about getting through to the other side, because it is also true now that those startups which do survive, which find product market fit, which make enough money to become self-sufficient, have a way better chance on the other side as economies pick up and, and, and spending is released and all of a sudden things look way brighter than they do now. Mm -hmm. That's a great place to be. So get there, mm -hmm. figure out a way to get there. And how do, how do you do that? How, how do you survive, uh, live on survival no mode and, uh, and still keep innovation? Because, I mean, if you're worried about surviving, you're not thinking about innovation or breakthrough uh, ideas, maybe, or you don't have the time. <laughs> well, I, I don't think they're in opposition, uh -huh. right? I think, I think this is more a question of, of tactics. Do we choose to spend more money now and grow here, or do we choose to survive longer and maybe focus uh, in smaller ways on our on our products. Maybe we have three engineers and we're thinking of hiring a fourth and a fifth and maybe we only hire one and we build a little bit less. 
I, I don't think that's an, in opposition to creativity. In fact, a lot of times the lack of money engenders creativity because you're forced to think about how to do things without spending money, which you know makes you more efficient and sometimes actually helps you create things that you wouldn't have created otherwise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and uh, you, you do accept late applications, right? Everybody can get out of here and apply to, to Y Combinator. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a little known fact. We closed our application on September 23rd officially, but we never close our application because how silly would it be for us to say, oh, um, you know, we look, we think you might be the next gigantic company, but you missed by a day, so we're not going to consider it. <laughs> you have to wait another six months. <laughs> that would be, well, and, yeah, and we don't know that we'll have the opportunity six months later, so we always want to look. We'll, we, we look at every application that comes in. All right. You, everyone? Every, each one? Every application that comes in gets someone, gets someone looking at it, every single one. Wow. Uh, <laughs> Filippo is saying that he waited to apply just because of this. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's great news. Okay. So now, now you know his name. You're going to look at it with more. Uh, I'll look more... for it, Filippo. <laughs> Good. Uh, so, alguém mais tem alguma, alguém tem mais alguma pergunta, alguma colocação? Ah, o Eric, você, quer fa você fala, Eric? Um, yes. Hello. Um... Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I was wondering, probably, Joff, uh, I think, I believe you know about a solution called Founder Suit that is used in the Valley by a few startups and uh, startup accelerators. Um, it helps fund, uh, founders get funding. Um, have you heard about it? Do you know if it's used? Do you have any intel about it? I know they have a few partnerships with some startup accelerators and I was wondering if it actually makes sense, if it, it has good any effect, if it's... I actually don't, it's called Founder Soup? It's Founder Suit. And they say that they have partnerships with YC, 500 startups and some other renowned accelerators. And I was wondering if it actually is helpful. Can, can you talk about Is it Founder Suite? Yeah, okay. yeah, so S-U-E-I-T, can you type the... Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the link right now. Uh -huh. There's something called Founder Suite. Yes. Just send it on the chat and then I think yeah. it's easier. Yeah. Yeah, this is, yeah, I have heard of this. Founder Suite, I think, yeah? Yes, yes. Um, so yeah, I, I, I was wondering they, they, if they just they help look this is super important um they, they don't say they have a partnership with white combinator they say that start some white combinator startups have used them what's super important when you're raising money is to be massively organized and whether you use something like founder suite or you use a, a spreadsheet uh, on google or or on microsoft it doesn't matter it's important to be super organized to, to, to create a table of all the people you want to talk to and all the, all the names and the status of your conversations and, you know, where you are in the back and forth, super important. And if, if that's a useful thing for you, that's fine. I don't, I, I don't think you necessarily need software for that, but, but um, you know, a spreadsheet is probably good enough for most people and it has been fine, but obviously some startups from YC, well, they claim some startups from YC, but I don't know. I haven't talked to any that have. Thank you. Sure. Okay, mais? Não? Beleza. Uh, bom, thank you, thank you, Jeff, for, for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you. Uh, you. After two or three years, this is the last time we, we spoke. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for making the time for, to, to, to talk to, to this audience. Uh, I mean, hope. Hope to see some of uh, uh, any of uh, some of these faces at YC at some point, uh, <laughs> and hope that we can make as as everything's going online now. Make maybe we can do this more often. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. Definitely, thank you, Gustavo. Good luck to to everyone, and I, I do hope to see you in a Y Combinator application soon. Best of luck. Bye bye. Obrigado, Bye. gente. Valeu, até a próxima. Obrigado, Obrigado pela audiência. Bye. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado. Boa noite a todos.